Oh, we're all right, everybody. Good evening. Good evening to you. Super excited. Let me restart this recording. All right. And then we're going to restart it up. Um, all right, guys. So we are ready to get this party started. Thanks, everybody, for rocking with me tonight. Um, we are going to have a good time. All right, tonight we are talking through the theology of money, the theology of money. Um, I wanna go ahead and just open with a word of prayer because I know money is a very, you know, um, challenging conversation for a lot of folks. Um, everybody comes from a different background, different experiences when it comes to money. And my prayer tonight is that we will really be able to uncover God's heart regarding money and really give you guys some truth regarding this. So, Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord God, we thank you for every single person that is a part of tonight's Entrepreneur's Bible Study. As we've been journeying through your word together, hearing truth and being confronted with some of the miscommunicated ideas and ideologies to help us to begin to behave and act in a way that is in alignment with your word so that we can be the men and women that you've called us to be. So, Father, tonight, I ask that your anointing would rest here tonight, that, Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified with every word that is spoken, and that your sons and daughters will be illuminated to go forth and produce the very things that you have created them to produce. Lord, we love you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. How is everybody doing tonight? Let me know in the chat um, how you're doing. Give me a scale to... Um, give me something that's happened this week that you want to celebrate. Please let me know in the chat room. Um, something that's happened this week that you want to celebrate and thank God for. Um, I would love to hear it just in the chat room as we kind of dive into this conversation regarding theology of money. Um, what is something you want to celebrate that God has done, that God is doing in your life, and you just want to throw it out to folks? Um, and if nothing great is happening, what is something you are asking the Lord to do? What is something you are believing God for? Um, I believe, is this our first, um, or maybe this is our second Bible study in January? So what are you believing the Lord to do in your life? What is something you're asking God for? Um, please let me know in that chat room as we get ready to dive into tonight's talk on the theology of money. The theology of money. Um, let me see if we got any folks dropping anything. All right. Well, good deal, everybody. Um, I see Erica saying, I'm celebrating a renewed mind concerning money. No more poverty mentality. Money is just one tool needed to advance God's kingdom on earth. Uh, Lassandra, I set out on faith and hired a business coach. Awesome, Lissandra. Doreen says, celebrating being debt-free in 2022. Uh, Ruth says, asking the Lord for discernment and business plans. Parisian says, I'm feeling great. Gained two commissions, and tomorrow's my birthday. Happy birthday. Katrina says, "Happy! I'm um, thankful that God has healed me. I, I had cold for almost a month. So grateful, Katrina, that you are healed. Uh, Clarence said, I got a bank notice with the internet intended to sell my home if I didn't come up with 900K, but I'm tr trusting God. Oh, Claire, and we're believing God with you. Adrian says, I'm believing God for new opportunities in the online space. Love that, um, Claire, and this is not over. In Jesus' name, it is not over. We declare that over you in Jesus' name. Well, alrighty then. Um, let's go ahead and get ready, guys. Thank you all for sharing some of your breakthroughs and what God is doing in your life. Let's go ahead and journey through this. How many of y'all excited for this conversation? As entrepreneurs, man, there shouldn't be anything that gets you pumped to hear another entrepreneur talk about money. All right. There should be, I mean, as entrepreneurs, this is our bread and butter. This is the thing that we have all been called to champion in the earth, um, that we will be ones that God will entrust with his wealth. We will be the ones that God would entrust with his resources. We should be excited to hear a conversation from someone who has been able to break through the poverty mindset and to begin to move forward in the gospel that we've been called to live out. And that is the purpose gospel, the gospel that says that as God gives me purpose, he's going to give me the funds and trust with me the funds that I need to fulfill that purpose. So let's go ahead, man. Let's get ready to go into this conversation regarding money and let's talk through this thing. So let's, we, first thing we've got to do everybody is I need everybody just to lay hands on themselves. You know, just go ahead and do a little, you know, right now, ain't nobody at your house. Ain't nobody gonna look at you weird. 
Ain't nobody going nobody gonna to look at you crazy. If you're still typing, that means your hand ain't on yourself. And just say, Father, help me to reset my mind to align with your word as it pertains to wealth creation, wealth management, and wealth deployment. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come on, somebody. I feel his anointing. Woo, y'all, y'all really want this. Y'all want this. All right, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Ooh, that's some hot tea, but it's good. All right, so let's go ahead and establish where we stand. And this is why we need entrepreneurs today. This is why we need men and women who have the heart of the kingdom, but as well are wanting to ch change the status quo. All right, are wanting to change the status quo. All right, the reality is that the average American shops six hours per week, but spends only 40 minutes spending quality time with their children. Now, I'm not talking about quantity time. I'm talking about quality time. All right, stat number two. By the age of 20, the average TV viewer has seen one million commercials. This is mind-blowing that by the age of 20 i'm sure everybody watching me on the sound of my voice is there anyone here that is under the age of 20 i just want to celebrate you for being here anybody that's 18 19 17 anybody that i would love to know um but i'm sure majority of you are over the age of 20 which means that this stat is true for you that you have seen over 1 million commercials all right number three more Americans declared bankruptcy than graduated from college. My, 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 my. More Americans have declared bankruptcy than those that have graduated from college. All right. So this is absolutely insane. All right. Next stat. In 90% 90, 90 of divorce cases, arguments about money were cited as the primary reason all right so we are seeing ladies and gentlemen by these stats that money is a big deal in our culture 24 percent of millennials demonstrate financial literacy all right which means that only a little bit over 70 percent of our of our country all right 70 percent of our country is in some way financial illiterate okay now you may ask well, well jamal what constitutes this financial literacy it's understanding the basics of how finance works 70 percent of americans do not have a long-term financial plan you ask most folks and the extent of their financial plan is to work most people's financial plan is just to keep a good job most people do not have a long-term financial plan, all right? And if they do say it, they'll figure it out later. Here's the biggest one. I'll figure it out when I get a good job that pays me enough to where I can finally start stacking away for retirement. I can't afford to put money in retirement right now. I'm not making enough today to be able to do that. Walking down y'all street, it's okay, don't hide. One in four parents reported never talking to their kids about household finances. Can please, let's pause here. How many of you, by a show of me in the chat, your parents never talked to you about the household finances, which meant how much money they made, how much money the bills were, how much money it took to manage the home. I'm not talking about maybe they talked to you about budgeting, talked to you about money, how many of you, I know this is me, to this day, I still don't know how much my parents made. To this day, I still don't know how much it took to run our household. To this day, I still don't know what bills were the heaviest, most stressful, right? I'm grateful that they took care of it, but they still left me out of it to where I never really understood what lifestyle my parents had us at. What were the things that we spent the most money on? What were the things we sacrificed, right? 
60% of adults in the United States admit to living paycheck to paycheck in 2019. 60% of adults admit to living paycheck to paycheck in 2019. Now, I know right here, this one is a big one for a lot of folks, all right? <laughs> Give me a quick sec. I'm just setting up my Instagram. <laughs> all right. Whoa. 60% of adults in the United States admit to living paycheck to paycheck. Now, come on now. This right here is another doozy that we all can be honest about. Growing up and then never learning the principles of money management to the degree that we consistently live above our means. More than half of America is eating their money away. <laughs> literally more than half of america is living their money away the very money you are bringing in goes right back out forcing you to wait until the next paycheck to be able to fund things i know i i know my parents grew up and i heard it all the time wait till i get paid <laughs> Wait, that was the that was that was the, the phrase in my house. Wait till I get paid. It, you know, my parents, they didn't tell me no. My mama didn't say no. She didn't turn me down. You all, you gotta wait till you gotta wait till next week. And then I remember there, how many of y'all grew up waiting to ask your parents for things until payday? So I didn't know, I didn't know how much money was being made. I didn't know the bills, but I sure know when they got paid. Woo! I know when that paycheck hit, boy. Come on, somebody, because guess what we doing? We going out to eat. I mean, soon. I mean, come on, who is? Are y'all with me tonight? Y'all, soon as paycheck hit, it was we were out to eat at somebody restaurant, boy. And I know Mama got paid because she said y'all can order what y'all want. All right, and I'd be like, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, sir, Amen, yes, Lord. Somebody said we had McDonald's. I mean, yes, you know what I'm saying? McDonald's was the thing, boy. That was it. You know what I'm saying? You can tell whenever they was they was behind on bills because we didn't go to Red Lobster. <laughs> <laughs> we went to McDonald's, right? So this is real, right? So these are the things that we're talking about. Here's the reality, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus said more about money. Yeah, can you turn the picture in, picture off? You can see. Yep. Jesus said more about money than any other single thing. Sorry to misspell there. Because when it comes to understanding humans' real nature, Money is of for first importance. Money is an exact index to a man's true character. All through scripture, there is an intimate correlation between the development of a man's character and how he or she handles money. We hear this preached all the time. Jesus talked about money all the time. Jesus, there's more scriptures about money in the Bible than any other scripture. But have we really processed why Jesus, why the Bible talks about money? Because if there's anything the Bible, Jesus, God is invested in more than anything else, it is the internal makeup of the children of the people he created. And there is nothing more determining of a person's character and their internal makeup than how he or she manages money. Because here's what the Bible says, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he would be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve, y'all listen to me. We have to think through this. Why does the Bible put money literally on the level of God? I'm screaming. It did not say you cannot serve both God and sex. It did not say you cannot serve both God and music. It did not say you can serve both God and love. 
these are some of the most strongest things that control humans every single day. M music is influential. Sex is influential. Love is influential. Y'all try to tell me out of three, them three things, what are more things in the earth that are more influential on people's daily decisions than those three things? Give me, can, please, I, I, enlighten me right now. I'm, I'm getting crickets. You too? Facebook? Zoom? Is there anything else more influential on a human's daily decisions, good or bad? Somebody finally got me one. Food, my God, yes, I will put food right up there. So the Bible does not say you cannot serve both God and food, God and music, God and sex, God and love. It says you cannot serve both God and money. That is how powerful money is to the human's influential nature. It is more powerful than food. It is more powerful than sex. It is more powerful than love. It is more powerful than music. Money has a lot of power. So before we go into the spiritual components of money, let's first talk about its core functions. What do what does money accomplish? What does money fulfill? What does money in its right purpose, intended purpose do, right? Core, core functions of money. Number one, it's a medium of, of exchange, okay? Not much expla explanation needed here. Money is a medium of exchange. So we can use this to exchange for certain items. You give me money, I give you a microphone. You give me money, I give you a camera. You give me money, I'll give you light. You give me money, it is a medium of exchange. No explanation needed here. Number two, it's a measure of value. You give me $1,000, I may give you a camcorder that has a camera view. You give me $10,000, I may give you a camcorder that can stream churches. You give me $100,000, I'll give you a camera that can make movies. Money is a measure of value. What someone, in, I know somebody said, what's a camcorder? <laughs> Praise God, boy, y'all youngins. <laughs> Money determines the value upon a thing. What somebody is willing to pay for something determines how valuable it is. If somebody is willing to pay $100,000 for your time, that determines how much your time is worth. If somebody's willing to pay for whatever, it's a measure of value. Number three, it's a means of payment. If something is accomplished that a fee was attached to it, money can be used to pay for it. Not much explanation needed there. So what we need to go through now are the two beliefs that have affected how we view money than any other. Are you ready for this? Put ready in the chat room. All right, ready in the chat room. The two beliefs that have affected how we view money more than any other views. All right, the first one is what we call asceticism. Asceticism, essentially this is a very proper and intelligent way of saying the poverty gospel, which is the less you have, the more spiritual you are. And this actually comes from a biblical quote unquote philosopher who his last name was asceticism or seti or something like that. I'll give it in just a bit, but he preached the gospel of the less you have, the more spiritual you are to the degree that literally he believed that it was not okay to be married. He believed that it was okay for people to sit on the side of the street and beg for money. And that showed humility. This is ascetism. And we see this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy, now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith 
They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead. They will say it is wrong to be married and wrong to eat certain foods, but God created those foods to be eaten with thanks and by faithful people who know the truth. Since everything God created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks, for we know it is made acceptable by the word of God in prayer. This is 1 Timothy chapter, first, first, verse one, first, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, the next view that was impacting our view of money is what many of us today struggle with in the Western culture is materialism. Materialism which basically is physical matter is the only reality. So we don't see money as spiritual as much as we see it as material, right? So Erica just said it perfectly. The church taught asceticism very well because the church was afraid of us becoming materialistic. They swayed more into money just being something that you had to be careful of and watch out for. So what we find has happened is because we have not agreed with ascetism, which is I'm trying to be poor, broke, and disgusted, we have overdone it to where we've gone into materialism to where all we see, all we see is what money can do and money can provide. We've lost, yes, that sense of alignment with God's heart for it. And what's happened is what we find with materialism, how you know that you have materialism, someone literally, a missionary went away to another country, third world country, and they were gone. And they were away for about maybe five to six years. And when she came back, she said, they asked her, hey, what was one of the biggest differences of being away in another country and being here in America? And she said, in America, I was, I'm blown away that we view homes as a sense of status. Whoop, conviction. If you got a million dollar house, you living good. You got a one bedroom apartment, you just getting started. Oh, bless your little heart, you got your little apartment. She said, in third world countries, in other countries, homes are not viewed as a symbolism of status. Homes are just viewed as a place where you live a place where you lay your head. But in America, everything has been centered around materialistic mindset. Now, granted, am I bad? I have a nice home. And I do believe there's a reason why the Bible says that God, there's mansions in his home, in his house. So here's the thing, we're, we're not out here serving a poor God. We just gotta find that balance. So the thing is, the reality is most of us don't even know what it's like to not be materialistic. We don't. It's very hard. Because materialism blinds us to the curses of wealth. Y'all need to process that one with me. Materialism blinds us to the curses of wealth. When the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the world but to lose his soul? What he is saying is what does it profit a man to be blind to how money can ruin him? Randy Alcorn says it like this, materialism is the mother of anxiety. Materialism is the mother of anxiety. Because money, clothes, it all comes back to a sense of self-worth and self-esteem and confidence. Being able to have that nice car or not having it. Being able to have the nice house or not having it. It determines whether or not people respect you or not, whether they follow you or not. Materialism is the mother of anxiety. John D. Rockefeller, if you don't know who he is, he's one of the Wealth Godfather says this, I have made many millions, but they have brought me no happiness. 
Y'all, that's something real. You're talking about one of the literally one of the most successful and wealthiest person to walk this earth saying, I have made many millions, but they have not brought me any happiness. Henry Ford, how many of y'all know who this one is? Created the first car. I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. What's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is they keep using this word happy. Why did Rockefeller have a similar quote to someone else who's just as wealthy saying the same thing that we're two, three generations away from each other? I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. So here's the reality, ladies and gentlemen, and you got to decide this. Either money is going to be a tool or it's going to be an idol. Either you're going to use money or money's going to use you. Because here's the reality. Money is a terrible master, but a good servant when you have the right master. Money is a terrible master, but a good servant when you have the right master master. I don't want any of you as entrepreneurs to ever get to a place where money begins to rule over you. I don't want any of you to get to a place in building your business that you view money as the path to a happier life. More money will not equal more happiness. There are things in this world that can make you happy that cost nothing to attain. You have to put money in a proper category and stop seeing it as the nucleus to a happier life and see it as a tool to be used to make life easier for you to be happier. Because money makes life easier for me to spend more time with my wife who makes me happy. Money makes things easier for me to take my family on vacations that makes me happy. Money makes it easier for me to go on date nights with my wife who makes me happy. Money makes it easier for me to take two weeks off of work and not have to worry about paying the bills because resting makes me happy. What I'm breaking down for you is you need to connect to what makes you happy and money just being a tool to help accomplish it, but you don't need more of it to do that. So let's walk through tonight how to make money your servant. Come on, somebody, who wants this right here? God, how do I make money my servant? Uh-oh, I'm about to, my, my computer about to die. I forgot to plug it up. Uh-oh. Well, guys, y'all have to give us one quick second. We about to have a technical difficulty. I'm glad I, I see this. Okay. Um. Hold on. And I'll, well, it was just about to get good. Did it, already, did it already go out? Okay, give us one quick second, guys, so we can figure this out before we, before I, huh? Um, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hold on, guys. We got a little technical difficulty. We're trying to make sure my laptop don't die um, on us tonight. Sorry, everybody. Give me one quick second. It was just getting good. And the devil just said, hold on. All right, back in action. All right, everybody. We we practice it for next week for for next week's entrepreneurs for next week's Bible challenge, and we try to we got a lot going on in regards to different setups, and it's definitely showing us we got some work to do to prepare for next week. All right, everybody. So, how to make money your servant? Thank you guys so much for your patience. I appreciate that. All right, so let's keep going. Number one, you got to know your role. You got to know your role. The reality is, is that God owns it all. We do understand that you don't live on earth. All right. We all have a home. And where my home is, I don't have a president. Where my home is, I don't have a politician who lives in a White House. Where y'all at tonight? Where are my Christian saints at? I come from a place where I have a king who is ruling a kingdom and in his kingdom, he owns it all. Everything belongs to him. Don't you ever forget that you do not belong here on earth. We are here temporarily as he brings extends his kingdom to the earth we are a part of a different species a different type so god owns it all number one and if god owns it all what does that make you it makes you a manager story Kid is in class, he's in class, and he grabs a young lady's pen that she found on the floor. He grabs it out of her hand and breaks it. And she's like, why did you just break that pen? That was my pen. He was like, where did you find this pen? She said, on the ground. He said, yeah, I dropped it. It was my pen first. So I have the right to break it. That's how we view money. It was God's first. We find it, we take it, and then we begin to act like it's ours. <laughs> I love that story so much. It just cracks me up. Cause that's what we do with money. We be out here acting like that. We own it like it's ours. And then the moment that it's, that is, you be like, wait, time out, that's my money. No, it's not, it's not your money. That money was not in your hands first. It did not come from you first. It came from him first. Because every single person that's had that money before you, they were made by God. It's all his. He owns it all. And the longer you take to get that revelation, the longer it will be for you to put yourself in the proper position to view money as a tool and not an idol. Because we worship things that we think we Oh, this is mine. Don't touch it. Get away from it. Why are you on my property? Why are you by my house? Why are you in my space? Why are you? We be out here tripping out. You can't begin to steward until you first recognize who's the true owner. And we all know that God has called us to be what? God has called us to be good stewards 
of our wealth. But you can't steward something. Do y'all know what, excuse me, do y'all know what the word steward means? We all, we love it. It's, it's a great term. It's a great word. But steward literally means to manage. And I'm sorry, we are in a culture that screams own it all. Own it all. You should own your home. You should own your car. You should own, 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 own. Even if you go to the store, where's your manager? You don't like the manager? What do you do? Uh-uh, I want to talk to the owner. Where's the owner at? I don't want to talk to the manager. So even in our culture, manager and management is not respected. Everybody wants to jump to be the owner. Everybody want to jump to be the number one. So the terminology of manager and management is not truly valued in our culture, which is why we all struggle with being great managers of money because we think we own it. The Bible says in Psalm 24, one, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. I didn't write the Bible, but I mean, it's not too hard to understand what everything means. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 24, one, the definition of stewardship is the use of God-given resources, time, talent, treasure, revelations, relationships, because it ain't just money. Y'all got to learn how to manage because money, is, money is, is more than just paper. Time, talent, treasure, revelations, relationships for the accomplishment of God-given goals. That is so good. Stewardship is the use of God-given resources, time, talent, treasure, revelations, relationships for the accomplishment of God-given goals. Y'all got that one? Everybody, I know you're probably writing it down. And you need to process this in prayer. Father, how am I stewarding my time? How am I stewarding my talents? How am I stewarding the money you're giving me? How am I stewarding the revelations that I hear every single day through preachers, through the word of God? How am I stewarding the relationships? This is, these all include the resources. Who gave you? The God-given resources. Can I ask somebody right now? Is there something in your life that you would consider a resource? but you have not truly taken the time to value its true worth in your life. How many of us are constantly going after more before we've truly taken the time to steward what we already have? And I'm talking straight to this dude right here. What up, talking to you, bro. God done gave you so much. He's entrusted so much into you. But every day, you have the opportunity to either strive for more or steward what you already have as God brings the more. Y'all say, I, y'all know I'm crazy. I'll be talking to myself. Straight up, right here, just point. I'm, I consider myself one of the most favored people I know, because I don't know a lot of people. So when I look at myself, I'm like, I feel like, I mean, compared to people I know, I feel like I'm pretty, I got a lot of favor in my life. And I, I'm pretty sure majority of, of you that I'm talking to right now, you can definitely look around and be like, dang, there's favor on my life. How am I stewarding the favor that God has given me? Do I spend more time complaining about not having enough than the time I am appreciating and stewarding what I already have? Number two, 
Number two, how to make money your master. Be found faithful. Be found faithful. Be found faithful. The Bible says in Matthew 25, verse 23, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't say my well done, good and rich servant. He didn't say my well done and good and busy servant. He didn't say my well done and good spiritual servant. Well done, my good and faithful faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your masters. Woo, there's that another word right there. There's that word right there, y'all. Happiness. Happiness. How to make money your master. How to make money your servant. Sorry. How to make money your servant. That it serves you versus it ma you master it mastering you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Faith plus consistent action equals faithfulness. Belief plus action, but it's not just action, it's consistent action equals faithfulness. And this is where most of us messed up because we're not consistent with our actions. When it comes to faithfulness, the amount doesn't matter. Every single one of you right now, under the sound of my voice, has some level of income that you have been entrusted with. And every single one of you stress about whenever I can make more, then I'll start to worry about how I manage it. Right now, I'm not making enough to invest. I'm not making enough to tithe. I'm not making enough. You will never make enough. It's a heart issue. It's not a season issue. It's a trust issue. It's not a money problem. When it comes to faithfulness, it's not about the amount. Because the same way you manage a million dollars will be the same way you manage a hundred dollars. Nothing will change if you don't change. Stop thinking that you need more to make things make sense. I shared this last week. Many people will say, man, I can't wait to be able to afford to pay, to pay for somebody um, somebody's uh, um, house. I can't wait to be able to buy somebody's house. Or I can't wait to be able to buy somebody a car. People will tell me this all the time. They say these things of, I can't wait to one day where I can afford to do that. I can't wait to one day I can afford to be that generous. You can. You can do it on your level. You may not be able to buy somebody a car, but you can pay their car note. You may not be able to buy somebody a house, but you can potentially pay their mortgage for one month. You need to be rich on your level and you need to have a rich mindset on your level. This is what this scripture means. Faithful over a few, ruler over much. This is my testimony right here. God, what can I do on this level to show you that I am faithful with the level I'm on? I'm going to be rich on my level. And guys, within the last five years, I remember five years ago not having enough money to be able to pay for somebody's car. And I gave them a car note. And then three years later, I'm buying somebody a car. Last year, I bought my dad a, a truck. Now I'm, I, and guess what? I haven't gotten to the level because each time I, when I first gave away my first car, it was my pay, it was a paid off car that I'd driven for about 
five years and I gave somebody that car, paid off, gave it to them. My dad's vehicle was a 2018, 2019, so it wasn't brand new. Guess what? Because I, I, can't, I couldn't afford to purchase him a brand new off the lot car. I'm not there yet. <laughs> so I bought him a used car. Pretty, I mean, I think that was, that's not bad. But guess what? At some point, I'm believing God to have enough money. Somebody said, still nice. Yeah, I'm rich on my level. So at some point, I want to get to the next level of rich where I can buy somebody a brand new car with zero miles off the lot and give it to them and say, there you go. Here are the keys. Boom, let's go. So right now, I'm rich on my level. I may not be able to purchase somebody a three-bedroom full home, but I can definitely pay your rent for six months. How can you be rich on your level? This is faithfulness. It's not waiting until it gets good. It's declaring it's good now. If I don't make another dime, I'm going to be able to live rich now. Many people think you got to wait. You don't got to wait. Let's do it now. So let's, let's end that same thing out, right? When it comes to faithfulness, the amount doesn't matter. It's about what, guys? Put that in the chat room. It's, it's about what? Come on, woo, I feel the Holy Spirit, man. It's about obedience. God will never ask me to do something that puts me in a bad spot. It's about obedience. If he's asking me to do something, he wants me to do it because it's for my good. Now let's talk about income. Ooh, I love, I love talking about income. Boy, listen, because ain't you can't do nothing without cash flow. What we talked about last week, what was the phrase that came out last week? Well, who, who with me? Where, where, my, where my faithful folks at? Somebody got my money. <laughs> Somebody got my money. Somebody. God done called me to do some stuff. Hey, somebody done got this, got the money. I ain't got enough. All right. Somebody got it. That's what that's what Jeff be out here doing. Jeff and Todd and Bill and John. They be out here, they be all they be out here sitting around each other's houses is out here just saying, yeah, yep, yep, guys, somebody got our money and we got to figure out how to get it. <laughs> and what I tell you, the poor, the poor want, the poor, the, the middle class buy, and the wealthy, what do they do? They create. They create. The poor want. Middle class buy, the wealthy create. Somebody got my money. And I'm not going to get it by wanting what other people have. I'm not going to get it by buying what other people created. I'm going to get it by creating things that people need. The poor want, the middle class buy, the wealthy create. And the last time I was checked, I was created to create because that's my God nature. So let's talk about income. There are two things that are going to determine your income, all right? Because what you make the goal is to keep as much of it as possible, all right? What did I teach you guys? The goal is to have multiple streams, but you got to have one stream to create multiple streams. Everybody be out here trying to have multiple streams too soon, too fast, before you have a secure stream that can spill over into multiple streams. And the number one determining factor to your ability to secure a stream is going to be, somebody put in the chat room, lifestyle. If there's anything I can testify that we did too soon 
was increased our lifestyle too fast. We made a lot of money, a lot of fast. And it caused us to begin to do things a little too soon before we had secured our cash flow. All right. So lifestyle is going to be one of the determining factors to your ability to do it fast, which is creating streams to secure yourself. Next week, I'll be teaching the believer's ladder to freedom. And the third step in the believer's ladder to freedom is financial freedom. The third step, financial freedom. First step, spiritual freedom. Second step, time freedom. Third step, financial freedom. The thing that will determine how fast you get to financial freedom will be lifestyle. And let me explain, what is financial freedom? Financial freedom is the ability to have your money working for you versus you working for it. It is your servant, not your master. The moment you have enough money working for you in businesses and in investments to where you, in, your, in the bank account, I don't believe in keeping lots of cash. I, I should, I should do a whole, this is a theology of money. It's not really a wealth creation, a wealth management session. But the reality is, is that your money needs to be working for you. It ain't doing nothing for you in your bank. But you need to be saving your money to prepare it to work. I say like this, you need to give your money a job. Does your money have a job? Your money needs a job. And in order for it to have a job, you probably need to create a job description. <laughs> Y'all want to be bosses? Y'all want to be CEOs? You should be giving the first person before you try to hire an employee, you should be hiring your money. And if you say, Jamal, well, what, what do you mean? Hire my money. You and I, you're not ready for an employee, my friend. You need to first learn how to make your money work for you. Then you can go get some humans. Don't be out here trying to make humans work for you if you ain't learn how to make money work for you. That's the whole, that was bonus. <laughs> so the lifestyles is simple lifestyle versus extravagant lifestyle. This is the stuff, man. Everybody's out here. Either you live in simple or you live in extravagant. I don't want neither. Uh-uh. I'm not trying to live simple because y'all, I got, y'all see my office. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 I have bougie moments, all right, bougie moments. There are certain things that I am really simple with, and there's some things that I do like to be a little extravagant with, you know what I'm saying? Like, I do like nice things. I like nice cars. I don't really care for clothes. I don't really care for shoes. At some point, I'll probably, you know, hire me a stylist so I can elevate that. I don't really go a lot of places, so I don't need a lot of nice clothes like that. I really don't. That's not my thing, but I do like going places. When me and Natasha travel, we're going to drop some money. I'm just saying, we gonna, we go on to the nice places. I'm trying to have it. When I walk in, they handed me a hot towel. I'm trying, when they walk, I want to make sure I got slip flops in the in the room. I want, I want two, three rooms. I don't want just one room when I go into the hotel room. I want my living room. I want the bedroom. I want a bathroom. I need multiple rooms going on so we can just create a homey environment in this suite right that's that's just over the years i've gotten a little bougie all right just you know once you get a little taste to the money i'm like oh i gotta keep making the money because i don't want to go back to the regular hotel room guy i don't want to go back to the coach guy i like first class lord it's nice up here i can you get free stuff oh yes they gotta pay for nothing i like it up here this is I, and i like folks walking by whenever everybody walking by look at that how you doing good to see you y'all go to the back oh damn i'm sorry I, hey i got a testimony i used to be back there but now i'm up here praise guys see god that does some stuff in my life see y'all see what i'm saying y'all don't want to play with me tonight i know right i can be my my wife said it. you know who said it to me first you know who said it to me first when we started really upgrading a little bit my mom my mom was like yeah y'all don't got a little boot my, whoop, girl be careful girl all right now you know what I'm saying? so the reality is y'all i know what it was like back in the day i know what it was like to sacrifice to say no and I'm telling everybody, people be thinking, man, like, is it okay to live extravagant? I don't believe in simple or extravagant. Y'all want to know, Jamal, what do you believe? What type of lifestyle do you believe the Lord has called us to live that's in alignment with his word, that doesn't come with shame or guilt? Y'all want to know what the word is? This is what I call. Oh, wait, before I get there, I've been teaching myself happy. 
basically this is simple lifestyle versus extravagant. I deserve this versus I can afford this. I want to really hit that before I go into what this word is. I deserve this versus I can afford this. That's really the mindset that really hurts a lot of us is we work really hard and then we buy things not because we can afford it. We buy it because we believe we deserve it. How many of y'all have seen people buy things, nice things that they can't afford, but then they'll justify it by saying, I work really hard. I deserve this. And then somebody else will come along. You buy something nice. You buy them a BMW. They buy themselves a BMW. You can't afford a BMW, but they buy it. And then they'll justify it. And friends will say, girl, you deserve it, girl. Buy yourself that, girl. And you're putting yourself in debt for something you deserve, but you can't afford. And here's the word that's gonna free every single one of you. This is the lifestyle I believe that God has called us to live, a strategic lifestyle. Can somebody put that in the chat? Strategic lifestyle. I don't wanna be simple. I'm not trying to be extravagant. I wanna be strategic. All right, and strategic means that I go before my purchasing moments and I plan out the things that I'm going to splurge on. I plan out the things I'm going to pull back on because the last thing I want to do is live my money away. I'm going to say it again. The last thing I want to do is live my money away because I need to make sure that I have enough that can keep working for me. So here's the truth about income, ladies and gentlemen. When you move into the strategic mindset, I need to learn how to live today that sets me up for success tomorrow. And I need to continue to have that behavior no matter what level I'm at. So when we were on food stamps, I had to be strategic with the food stamp season. So the money that was coming in, grateful that it didn't have to go to food, food stamps was covering that. And I was using the money coming in to get me out of food stamps. Then when I got to $10,000 a month, all right, I've got to make sure that we don't spend all of our $10,000 a month because I'm going to need some extra money to get me to $20,000 a month. Then once I get to $20,000 a month, I've got to make sure I don't spend all of this because I need some of this to get me to $40,000 a month. And now granted, ladies and gentlemen, I now run a multi-million dollar business. This multi-million dollar business requires me to have a strategic mindset with all of the income that comes in to ensure that I am preparing for tomorrow. So I can't spend it all. I've got to learn how to spend enough to be, quote unquote, excited about making more. Because that's what a lot of people will do. Oh, did it die? A lot of people will get to a place where they are saving so much that they don't get to a place of experiencing their money to make them excited about making more. Y'all, when I bought my Range Rover, I was like, yo, ooh, make me want to work a little bit harder. I like it, I like it in here, all right? I like it in here. I like how it makes me feel when I get into it. Just the room, I mean, how it drives. Right now, guys, what, do I, what am I working towards? I'm trying to figure out, man, God, I want a sports car so bad. No car seats in the back, just two-seater sports car, me and the wife, boy, driving down the road. But guess what? I can't afford a sports car. I can't. Right, not right now. <laughs> not right now. But when I tell you, it's, 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 it's there, boy. I see it, and I'm, and I'm doing the things that requ are required to keep me motivated to want to get it. And when I can't afford it, not do somebody, you right now, somebody can say, well, Jamal, man, you got it, bro. You can do it. You deserve it. No, I don't. I have not earned a sports car yet. I haven't. 
not that I, I my Range Rover is my my drive all the time car. I haven't earned a weekend car yet. I'm not there yet. Well, who determines that? Me, based upon my strategy. Delayed gratification is the key to being able to win over the game. So your strategy is based upon you and your spouse sitting down and saying, where are we going? What are we doing? How are we setting ourselves up for the future? The moment you sit down and you actually create a strategic financial plan, it is so, what's the word? It's more than hard. It's just challenging. It's challenging. So somebody's asking, I got to get my thing back on because I think my, uh, I don't know what happened. Um, so we've got to get to this place. I got to pull my slide back up because I'm, I'm like, Lord, do you? Cool. So strategic lifestyle, ladies and gentlemen, is the key. All right. Strategic lifestyle. Now let's move into, now what I want to talk about how to increase your income is 831. Dang, it's an hour. Woo! 831. How to increase your income? How to increase your income? Everybody want to know? Skill stacking. Skill stacking. You have to learn how to use one skill to develop another skill that helps you develop another skill that helps you develop another skill to where you get to the point to where you have so many skills that stack upon each other. They can't be separated. They have to work together to make you so indispensable in your craft to where people are chasing you down for you to do the thing that you do well. So my first skill that I started off with, my first skill was the skill of communication, right? Being able to talk. But what was I talking about? I had to add another skill, the skill of talking about relationships right? The ability to communicate and teach on relationships. Then I add another skill, which is the ability to write. Then that skill, being able to write the information, I can communicate, I can talk naturally, came out the womb, right? But then I go to another skill of relationships, learning about relationships enough to, to, to talk about it. Then the next skill, writing about it, then I was able to create a book. Now the next skill of knowing how to sell the book, and then now the next skill of learning how to sell it consistently through funnels. And then the next skill of learning how to now create digital courses. And I'm just continuing to stack these skills that make me more and more and more valuable. So what mo most people get wrong when it comes to income increase is they look at what more can I do? No. Stop trying to do more and become more valuable so you can do less and make more. Come on, where y'all at tonight? I'm really helping y'all with some true understanding. How can I become more valuable so I can do less but make more? It really does, it doesn't happen naturally. It really requires you having to plan how many y'all listen to will smith's book absolutely incredible incredible book and he says this he says i got into music and the moment that music died tv popped in and i learned a principle because i almost missed out on tv because i wasn't preparing for the next thing of the skill i learned in making music was creativity and then now that creativity gave me the ability to now in storytelling. He said, I story told through music. Then that skill translated right into TV, but I wasn't ready for TV. And then he goes on to say that I almost missed out on the opportunity for the Fresh Prince because I wasn't ready to audition. And he said, but the moment he landed Fresh Prince, he immediately began to think the moment TV is no longer working for me, 
what is the next thing I will do? And how do I begin to prepare for that thing now? And he already knew the next thing I've got to prepare for is movies. Movies. So you got to see success leads clues. So what am I doing right now? I know for the rest of my life that I will somehow, some way be around communicating to people and using my communication skill. But how I communicate now through relationships, through digital marketing, it may not work forever. So I'm already preparing. How do I begin to now establish Jamal Miller so I can be able to flow in and out of different topics and people want to listen to me? How do I begin to now? I've established myself as an expert in relationships, but I've now got to establish myself as a thought leader, as someone people respect for whatever I say. So I'm preparing my brand to become, to be able to monetize my information no matter what I talk about. I'm not there today, but guess what? That's why the Entrepreneur's Bible Study is the step in that strategic plan to increase my skills. Y'all, right now, let's be 1,000. Come on, y'all. If I was talking to my TOU group, I would have thousands of people on because I've already mastered and have momentum in that place. But I know that's not what I want to do forever. I'm preparing to go to another level. But it's causing me to have to reset how people view me, which is why tonight I got 38 on Instagram. I got 61 on Zoom. I got maybe a 50 on Facebook because right now I haven't established myself as the go-to resource for business and Bible. I have a community, but I'm not known and respected because I haven't labored in this area. Everybody wants to be an overnight success. It doesn't happen like that. I'm giving so much away right now, y'all. It's 836 and my computer is, is definitely saying no, 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 no. Let me say, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. The next thing we got to talk about is investments, and we'll be done tonight. Investments. All right. Investments. So we've talked about, um, we've talked about income. We've talked about now we're going into investments. I'm not going to go deep on this one because I don't have a lot of time. All right. But for investments, the Bible says Proverbs 13:11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle. But whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Can somebody please put in the chat room? Y'all don't want to hear this gospel, but I much rather get slow. Oh, I much rather get rich slow than get rich fast. Warren Buffett got rich slow. He did not hit the lottery and get rich fast. I much rather get rich slow than get rich fast. Wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Do y'all want to know why getting rich fast dwindles? Because you can't reverse engineer, reverse engineer and usually you can't repeat how it happened because a lot of luck was in it. How do people win the lottery? It's, that's no, there's, no, there's no skill in winning the lottery. There's no experience in winning. You can't remember. You can win the lottery once and try to do it again, and you may never ever do it again. You get rich slow. You can continue to repeat what is working, so it continues to increase. If I was to lose all my money tomorrow, I could reverse engineer exactly how I did it and do it again. Stop wanting to get rich fast. You have your entire life to get rich. Get rich slow so you can increase it. And most importantly, y'all, you can pass it down to your children and your children's children. The philosophy, the mindset, the behavior, the discipline. There's so much in getting rich slow. Now, granted, if God blesses you, now I'm not saying 15, 20, 30, 40 years, y'all, but I'm definitely not saying next year, unless you've been in the game for five, 10 years and you're due, like I was. <laughs> next thing, inheritance, inheritance. The Bible says, Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the, sinner leaves, the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So we all understand that some of you 
got to get off of this high horse. And I want to talk about investments a little bit when it comes to real estate. Everybody, I know everybody's all about trying to get into real estate. Everybody's trying to get into other streams of income. My big thing is I believe in it. Here's how I view real estate. Real estate very much is putting your savings in bricks. All right. Last year, my wife and I became millionaires and we immediately de deployed our money into real estate to hold it. It's not for money creation. It's for money holding. I, we did not make it. We don't make a dime. Well, current, we put everything we make in real estate. We put it right back into our property to increase its value. I'm just holding my money there until I get another thing that I need to put it to to make it more money. I'm making the money work for me. I'm making the money work for me. And I didn't have to read a bunch of books on real estate. I just had, you just got to have something that you do master that you now can go. And then now my next thing, eventually I want to get to a place where I'm not buying just real estate. I want to start buying businesses, right? These are all the things you have to get to a place. But before you can get to buying real estate, before you can get to buying businesses, before you can do any of these things that are considered investments, you need to first be investing into yourself to have the ability to create the cash that can fund investments. I am my number one investment. Number three, guard your heart. I don't have time, man. It's 841. All right. The Bible says tithing is a guardian of the heart. <laughs> tithing is training wheels to giving. I really want to break this down more, but I don't have the time tonight, ladies and gentlemen. My next point here is please, 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 regarding tithing, just understand that as a wealth creator, you have to be a person who understands the revelation behind tithing and how it guards the heart. Because you need to have the ability as you continue to grow in levels of wealth to protect your heart from turning on you. That's why God created tithing. It's not to limit you. It's not to make your pastor rich. It's literally a technology created by God to, to protect your human nature as you grow in success from turning on yourself and becoming all about you. Tithing prepares you to be a giver. Tithing, yes, includes giving, but tithing is not the fullness of the giver that you were created to be. It's the training wheels. You were not created to be on training wheels forever. God's intent is that you would break off the training wheels and get to a place where you are riding freely, where he is able to do more with your money than just your 10%. The last time I checked, you should not be out here looking at your 10% as hard to give. You should be at a place where you are planning. How do I give 15%? How do I give 20%? How do I give 30%? My decree is that I wanna be so wealthy towards the end of my life that I am living off of 10% of my income and giving away 90. Where y'all at tonight? That's where my faith level's at. I don't want to be known as the man that made a lot of money. I want to be known as the man that gave it all away. So what tithing does is tithing trains you on how to put give, make giving a priority so you can experience it at your level. You can experience it at your level. But as you continue to increase, you should be making plans to give more away than 10%. I love giving money away. I love being a blessing. I love creating things that give jobs and create jobs. And man, I just, I just love it. Number four, never stop growing. And I believe that's it. Never stop growing. So no matter how much money you make, no matter whatever you do, never stop growing. And basically the principle there 
is that you need to always continue to have a mindset of what's the next thing I need to learn so that I can continue to be a good steward of the income. So I want all of you under the sound of my voice to be the ones, excuse me, that God entrusts with millions of dollars. But your call to action, if you're not a millionaire today, your call to action needs to be, if I was a millionaire today, what would I be doing? How do I start acting like a millionaire today? So whenever the millions come, I'm just going to, I just keep doing what I have already been doing. Don't let it be that you got to wait to have millions in your account to start acting like a millionaire. When we became millionaires, nothing really changed because I was already acting like a millionaire when I had $1,000 on my account. I was acting like a millionaire when I had $10,000. I was acting like a millionaire when I had 100000 Why did I become a millionaire? Because I was already acting like one. And now I'm asking God, if, you, if it is your will for us to be billionaires, God, cool, man. But guess what? It ain't going to make me more happier. I just got to become more responsible. <laughs> That's just a lot of responsibility. But it's not going to make me happier than what I, I have a nice house. And yeah, we can maybe afford more nicer things. But the responsibility is just going to increase. Because you will always find things to buy. And if you don't learn self-control with a hundred dollars, you're not going to have self-control with a million dollars. Well, man, I'll have more than enough to do with. No, you will find, you will find a way to spend all the money if you do not have self-control, which is why you must learn how to continue to grow. So ladies and gentlemen, for those of you under my side of my voice and you're listening to this, man, I've had a great time with y'all tonight. I really pray my transparency, my honesty, um, is, 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 is worth it. What I want is next week, guys, I'm doing a five day challenge called the five day unlock your business challenge. If you think I'm teaching good stuff tonight, I promise you, you got to come next week. All I'm teaching tonight is ideology. It's mindset. It's philosophy. It's biblical, biblical principles. I'm actually teaching strategy next week. How do you now do the thing? And I'm going to be walking through the very process that I had to go through to learn how to unlock the business within me and now get the skills that I needed to be able to become a wealth creator. All right. So what I would ask is that if you haven't signed up, please go to unlockyourbusinesschallenge.com. How many of you have not signed up yet, but you are going to sign up tonight and you're going to spend five days with me next week and I'm going to teach you how to turn your skills, your gifts, your passions into profitable online businesses so you can create cash flow so you can be able to become that strategic lifestyle liver and have the ability to fund the kingdom all right for those of you that are signed up i can't wait to spend next week with you i cannot wait please go to unlockyourbusinesschallenge.com do not delay do not play around the information i'll be sharing next week literally literally is worth thousands of dollars and I will be teaching it all for free. All for free. All right. People always ask, Jamal, how do I get one-on-one -on -one time with you? How do I, man, can I pick your brain? This is better for you. I promise you. If I was to give you my phone number and you called me tonight, I would not be able to do you as well as I will do you next week as I'll be breaking stuff down in ways that is going to be super clear to where you literally next week will be able to take the information and go launch an online business that begins to generate you money within the first 90 days. Unlockyourbusinesschallenge.com. All right. Unlockyourbusinesschallenge.com. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with me on Zoom. Thanks for hanging out with me on Facebook. Thanks for hanging out with me on Instagram. I love you guys so much. Have a great night. Great night. We've been on here for almost more than an hour and a half. I'm revved up. I'm ready. I'll see you guys next week. All right.